Hello, beloved, beautiful beings. Today I want to tell you a story that goes back, the energy of it goes back to um, school days. Specifically high school, but it actually starts before that. So I want to talk about my own personal experience with mean girl energy. And when I say mean girl, I don't mean specifically just girls, but typically this attitude rears its head in girls in their teenage years. But it can be exhibited, felt by everyone boys, girls, men, women. Sometimes it continues even into adulthood. And that's the reason I want to address it today. Because sometimes we experience this energy and we might not know what to do with it. Now going back in my own personal experience, I have my cameras jiggling just a bit because my cat is behind my computer eating his breakfast, so uh, bear with me on that. Um, I first encountered this energy as a youngster in elementary school. I had a tendency to attract and befriend the kids who were not the cool kids, um, the kids that maybe had problems or had some uh, difficulties going on in their lives. The kids that were more concerned with trying to survive in some way than some of the others who had more privilege or more acceptance or felt that they were in some way um, nurtured more than some of the kids that I tended to run with. I had friends who had, whose parents had problems in their marriage. I had friends who were considered slow or had some learning difficulties. I had friends who were a little different and tended to have, because of these differences, they were not accepted into some of the groups in school uh, that kids ran in. I'm not talking about teachers, although that did occasionally happen. But the groups that the kids ran in, who they formed friendships with, who gravitated toward each other. You know, I was different in some of those ways, but I also had um, a tendency to score higher on academic levels, or I had... Um, My One of my problems was that we moved around a lot and I didn't get to form long-lasting friendships until um, much later toward high school. So my friends were the kids that were really quiet or that were in some way different or felt like they were different. Uh, back then we didn't recognize autism. In fact, I never heard the word autism until I was nearly an, an adult. So, the, um, those kind of neurodivergent sorts of kids were the ones that I tended to be friends with. And as I got older, my friends then continued that pattern. So I had um, wonderful friendships with kids who were considered 
um, slow who had learning disabilities. I had wonderful friends with kids who um, didn't fit in the normal male-female kind of um, pattern that uh, most people identify. I had friends who were trans. I had friends who were gay. I had friends who were bi. I had friends who were either academically excelled or academically were behind. I had every sort of friend except for the cool kids. I never ran in that crowd. I never liked that energy. That energy was always put offish to me. Um, now I can I, I can fit in almost anywhere because I can be invisible. And so I can get into groups just by being observant and mirroring back the sort of behavior. So if I wanted to be in one of those groups, I could have been. But I chose not to because I didn't like the energy. The energy of those groups is judgmental. It's elitist. It wants to be in competition. It wants to rise by stepping on someone. If uh, the attitude in these groups is, if it's not exactly like me, I don't want it. If it's not the same um, financial tier, if it's not the same academic tier, if it's not the same um, interests, if it's not, if we disagree on anything, then that automatically puts you out of the group. And you're expected to reflect the attitude of this clique that, um, uh, for lack of a better term, I'm calling the mean girl group. Because that energy doesn't have the self-confidence to be an individual for each of the people in that group to be individuals. Instead, they rely on the group identity and they will, you know, espouse their accomplishments and say, oh, aren't we great that we do this thing and we are um, so powerful together, which may be true, but if you're powerful in a low vibrational way, that's not a satisfying thing. Anyway, I have encountered that energy even in our own community. And it saddens me because it's immature, it's self-satisfying, it doesn't allow for growth, not real growth, and it wants to tear down anyone that doesn't agree with it. It saddens me. But the way that you deal with it is to let it be. Let it burn out itself out. Let it run its course. You can observe it from afar without being involved in it. And if you become involved in it, if you don't first get expelled from the group, you can take yourself out of it. You don't owe that energy anything. Especially, you don't owe it the right to feed on your energy. 
So, my beloved beings, I thought I would come to you and talk to you about this subject today because it's been on my mind lately. And I wanted to ask my guides and my angels and ancestors, my ascended masters, my deities, all the way up to source, I wanted to ask, what do they have to say about this? What are the, the ramifications of it? How do we extricate ourselves from it? What do we do when we encounter this, or if we become entangled in it, just by sheer being in the wrong place at the wrong time, or being beguiled because it's charming. That's what makes it insidious. It's charming. Oh, come in. We love you. We will take care of you. We know what's right. We know the right way to do things. If you encounter that or you've become entangled in it, how do you get away from it? How do you leave it behind and do something a little more healthy? So I'm asking my guides to let us know. Let us know how do we deal with that energy. So today I'm using the Deviant Moon Tarot because I thought that it might be an appropriate um, artistic expression of what I'm trying to learn today. And the Oracle of, the, of Shadows and Light. I'm using these two decks. And um, I just pulled three cards from the Deviant Moon. The first one, the Nine of Cups. So a thing may seem like it's the answer to all our desires. We may be wishing for that genie to pop out and give us something useful, some place to belong. But very often what we ask for, once we get it, we see that it's not really what we wanted or needed. So there's that wishing. The next card I drew was the Nine of Pentacles. That abundant private garden. In this picture, you see this figure, this solitary figure. It doesn't seem all that happy. doesn't seem all that thought out or put together. This figure seems a little lonely. And then I got the King of Swords. This can be an authoritarian figure. This can be someone who wields that sword and steps on that figure at the bottom with an iron hand that we do things this way and no other way. We think this and nothing else. If I tell you you're going to be a fluffy bunny, you're going to be a fluffy bunny. That's this kind of energy that it may on the surface seem like what we're looking for. But underneath is this, is this authoritarian figure that wants everything done his way. And the final card I got, the one on the bottom, is a strength card. And in this deck, 
This is brute force strength. Is that what you really want? Do you really want this person using brute force and telling you it's everything you ever wished for? Now go to your garden and be happy. Is that really what you want? I think probably not. I think that that energy is not necessarily what we want. So if we wake up one day and we think, find out that the, what we've been experiencing isn't exactly what we signed up for, and it's not meeting our, our needs anymore, that it's not giving us, it's not feeding us, it's taking from us, it's and feeding on us, it's not feeding us, it's not giving us what we need, it's not nurturing. So what do we do? What do we do if we find ourselves in that situation? Because we were lured in. We walked into it a little bit with blinders on and it's not what it was supposed to be. What do we do when that happens? The first thing is that we acknowledge the strange Valentine, that love is strange. It was pretty. It was alluring. It sounded like everything we wanted and needed. And we loved it at first. The ghost of the pumpkin patch. Count your blessings. Did you get out? Do you have some scars? Are you happy that that's all you have is just a few scars? Count your blessings. Know that you can overcome this. You can get past it and be in a healthy place again. Because you have the dress of alchemy. Release your power. Put two things together that you've never put together before and see what happens. You have that experience now. Take it, learn from it, and go forward. Now you know how to recognize it. Now you know what it looks like. Now you can avoid it in the future. Learn the lesson. Do the alchemy. Put all of that knowledge into that bottle and you will know what to do with it. The key word on this card is to release your power. Don't just release it, step into it. Step into your power, not the power of that energy. And finally, the solution Three witchy sisters, the power of three. Find yourself your real tribe. Find yourself the group that really feeds you and nurtures you. It's right there. All you have to do is look around and you will find it. And remember, my beloved beings, that you are loved and you are welcome, and you are not alone. Until next time.